Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's EFRDA Virtual Academy. I appreciate you all taking the time out of your day to um, join up with us. And on behalf of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission <clears throat> and the Effort of Cloister Associates, we're so glad that you take the time, as I said, to join us every, every month. We have Doug Gear, who's a volunteer at the Effort of Cloister, um, works Saturday mornings as a tour guide, helps us out in other areas as well. And he likes clocks and has done some research on uh, Cacauco Valley, Lancaster County clocks, and he's gonna be sharing that information with us tonight. So on that note, Doug, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to be here tonight and to share my interest in uh, antique clocks. And when we're talking about the 18th and 19th century, we're really talking tall case clocks, otherwise known sometimes as grandfather clocks. Now there were other clocks to be sure at that time, there were shelf clocks and even some watches, but uh, they were not as popular as the tall case clock and certainly nothing could match the accuracy of the tall case clock. They were the most accurate timepiece for several centuries until uh, the 1930s, roughly. So my plan tonight is to talk about three things, basically, the parts of a clock, the clock makers, and then look at some clocks themselves and enjoy that. When we start out about clock making, it was an involved, task. It took a lot of training. A person had to serve as a, um, an apprentice for seven years, usually beginning at the age of 14. And then after they completed their apprenticeship, they worked as a journeyman, typically for two years, sometimes one, and then they could become a master clockmaker, usually around the age of 23 at the youngest. When you think about that, that's basically nine years of training, not unlike a person today going for a doctoral degree. Uh, it's really a pretty advanced uh, study. In colonial America, the center for clockmaking was basically Philadelphia. That was the recognized headquarters, you might say. Boston also received a lot of recognition as a good clockmaking area. But you know, out here in the rhubarb patches of Lancaster County, um, these rural clockmakers were not given their due uh, originally. People just figured they were not measure up to the Philadelphia standard. The fact is, actually, Lancaster County clockmakers were extremely qualified and made some beautiful clocks, to be sure. There are two kinds of tall case clocks. Um, there is the 30-hour version and the eight-day version. As you can imagine, the eight-day version was more expensive. The 30-hour version, a little bit cheaper. What it means is you wind the clock either once a day or once a week. Now, here in Lancaster County, Stacy B.C. Wood Jr. is probably the uh, leading expert on Lancaster County clocks, and he says there were about 100 clockmakers during this time frame of roughly 1750 to 1850. Of those, 20 were to be found in the Cocalico Valley here in northern Lancaster County. Of those 20, seven were members of the married congregation at Ephra, which I think catches some people by surprise that there were so many clockmakers associated with the Ephra cloister. In addition to these clockmakers, 
the brothers also made a number of clock cases in their wood shop. Um, interestingly enough, the case was almost never made by the clockmaker. That was made by someone who was skilled in woodworking, a joiner or a skilled carpenter. And yet the clock is always identified by the name of the clockmaker. The poor joiner who put so much work into making the case was almost always anonymous, never got credit, but that didn't stop him from doing his job. I want to briefly look at um, the parts of the case, which is very simple to identify. There's three parts, basically, the hood, also known as the bonnet, the waist in the middle, and the base, of course, at the bottom. The hood would come in three versions, the flat top, the arched top, and the broken arch pediment, which is what you're looking at here. By far, the broken arch pediment was the more familiar and more common uh, style. The flat top tended to be used early on, not so much by the time you get to about 1800 and uh, certainly less thereafter. The flat top clock also typically, not always, was used for 30 hour clocks as opposed to um, the eight day movement. Looking at the dial of the clock, as you can see, there's a number of parts to that. But first, let's just talk about the material used for the dial. Among English clockmakers, up until about 1772 to basically the Revolutionary War, um, the brass dial was much preferred. Among German clockmakers, the iron dial was preferred during that same time frame. But what happened that changed all of that? Well, in 1772 in Birmingham, England, two men by the name of Wilson and Osborne created the white dial. The white dial used an, an iron dial painted white with the numerals painted on it. And the decorations likewise, in most cases, were painted on it. This created a much more attractive look, an easier look, uh, more pleasing to the eye, and became extremely popular. Now, that was in 1772 in England. It took a few years to catch on in the American colonies, but by the time it started to catch on, we had a problem called the Revolutionary War. And the Revolutionary War brought an end to trade relations with England. So American clockmakers could not get these white dials during that time frame. A few uh, eager persons in the American colonies tried to make their own white dials but they could not begin to match with quality or uh, consistency of the English dial. After the Revolutionary War ended and trade relations resumed, the white dial became almost a universally accepted uh, part of these tall case clocks. You can see some of the sections of the dial, the top part, if there was an arch on the top, the early clocks did not have that, they were square, but uh, the top part was the apex, which may or may not have a moon dial in it, showing the phases of the moon. The spandrels are the corners of the dial and always were decorated in some way. The chapter ring is a name that they gave to the circle of numbers. I don't know why they call it a chapter ring, but they did. The older clocks almost always used Roman numerals. And then later they began introducing Arabic numbers. And by 
1800, it could go either way, depending on the preference of the customer. But one interesting thing, look at number four on this dial. We would expect to see a Roman numeral four as I, V. Instead, on clocks, they always did it as four eyes. I have no idea why, but that was one of the peculiarities of clock making, I suppose. I also like the, um, the frowny face there in the middle, um, which can either be a frown or a mustache, I guess, depending on how you want to look at that. That would be the calendar wheel. Wasn't always uh, shown that way, but uh, typically it was. This particular one um, is worn to the point where you can't read the numbers. I'm sorry about that. But um, on the dial itself, there would be a number showing the day of the month. And then this clock has dimples, as I refer to them. Winding arbors, these two dots um, to the right and the left of center. Those are where you would stick the key in to wind the clock. And um, whenever you saw these on a clock, you were pretty much assured that it was an eight day clock. 30 hour clocks did not have winding arbors like this. You had to reach inside the case and pull the chain on a 30 hour clock. This particular model also has a separate dial for the second hand um, that may or may not be present on a lot of clocks. Now we're going to look at the movement of the clock. And to begin with, we'll look at the escapement assembly. The escapement is literally the heart of the clock. It takes the energy that is generated by the weights and the chain, and it transfers that energy and disperses it throughout the rest of the movement so that the hands turn as they are supposed to. There were two kinds of escapement. Um, the anchor recoil is the earlier version on the left, the deadbeat came along a little later on the right, but even after the deadbeat came along, many clockmakers preferred to use the anchor recoil and it could have been interchangeably used uh, depending on the whim of the clockmaker. But look at the wheel that's turning. On the anchor recoil escapement on the left, you'll notice it's turning clockwise one notch at a time but every time it turns, it has a little bounce to it. It bounces backwards or recoils. Um, that would translate to the hands on the clock, the minute hand and or the second hand, having a little bounce to it every time it uh, changed position. The deadbeat escapement did away with that bounce. And you can see that that wheel is moving very smoothly in the clockwise position with no uh, recoil. This was one way, if you did not know who made the clock, you might be able to catch a clue by looking at the escapement because some clockmakers preferred one style over the other, but it wasn't a dead giveaway because as I said, uh, sometimes they would um, interchange between uh, the two. We're going to look here at the pendulum. This is the bottom of the pendulum taken inside the case. The, at the bottom of the pendulum is this round weighted disc. The disc is called a bob, not a Robert, it's a bob. We're on nickname basis here. Um, the weight of the bob keeps the pendulum uh, swinging effectively and evenly from side to side. Underneath the bob is a little a nut called an adjustment nut or regulation nut. This particular one happens to be a very simple square nut put on a threaded 
uh, rod, some of these nuts were more advanced, more decorative, uh, but anyways, this one's a simple one. But it's also very important. If your clock is running too fast and you want to slow it down, you would turn that nut just a quarter of a turn usually to lower the bob. If the clock is running too slow and you want to speed it up, you turn that nut in the opposite direction. Usually a quarter of a turn is all it needs and it will raise the bob ever so slightly and cause the clock to go a little faster. You would have to do this over a period of a couple of days and see how it's running. And uh, eventually you find that uh, you can keep it very accurate uh, with no problem. The easy way to remember that is if your clock has to go slower, the nut has to go lower. If the clock needs to speed up, the bob has to go up. With that, we're going to go and look at the actual movement. This is a picture of the movement in the clock that sits in my living room. I've taken the hood off in order to get to the movement and take photos from each side, the left side and the right side. And um, this is sitting in the case, but without the hood on. The first part I want to point out are the plates. The plates are rectangular in shape. They're vertically placed and uh, evenly apart. The plates are what I would call the motherboard of the clock, if you want to use a computer terminology. Everything is fastened to the plate and it holds the whole thing together. Um, these plates are made of brass. Most of them were. Some of the older clocks might have been iron. Here, the red arrow is pointing to the plate pillar. The plate pillar kept the plates in place and equally um, apart from each other. They basically hold everything in place. Typically, there were four plate pillars. They were found in each corner of the plates. My clock naturally is an oddball. I have three plate pillars in mine, two at the top, one centrally located on the bottom, which can just be seen a little bit there behind the chain, right there, if you can see the arrow. The plate pillars can also give a clue who made the clock because most uh, clock makers had a specific style of pillar that they used. Mine is um, made of brass. It's very smooth. It's tapered so that it's a little thicker in the center and less thick towards the plates. Down here in the corner, I have a picture of another one just for sampling. Uh, this is a uh, works that are uh, were made by um, John Hoff Sr. in Lancaster. And you can see his plate pillar. It is not tapered. And um, it has a collar right in the middle. Most of these did have some kind of a collar. They would vary from one to the other. Mine, of course, does not have that at all. But that can be a clue because, like I say, each clockmaker tended to use a particular uh, style of plate pillar. Here I'm pointing out some pinions. There were oh, four to six pinions in most clock movements. A pinion is just a very small uh, gear that is um, used to drive a larger gear. And it's fastened onto an, an arbor. Uh, there are two kinds of pinions, the open-ended, which is what is in my clock. And that means simply that it's a solid piece of um, 
grass that was, the teeth were cut into it. And then there's the lantern pinion shown in the picture down here as a, a sample. The lantern pinion is so named because that one end looks to somebody like a lantern. And um, some clock makers preferred that kind, others preferred the open-ended. So again, if you did not know the clock maker, that could be a clue who it might have been if you were familiar with their style and their works. Here I'm showing the pendulum assembly. It begins with the pendulum bridge at the top, which is a vertical piece of brass fastened to the plate. The pendulum hangs from that and is held in place by this little cap on, on the very top. And then you have a spring. The spring is simply a very thin piece of metal that is flexible and to it is attached the actual pendulum at the bottom there. Uh, some early clock makers like Jacob Gorgas of Hinkletown often tied his pendulum to the bridge, um, but typically they were not, they were fastened in this manner. And then you have the crutch. The crutch is this large L-shaped uh, apparatus here, and then it goes on the way up to the top. The crutch actually has two prongs or forks on the bottom, and the pendulum sits inside that uh, little fork. And um, then up here at the top, it is attached to the escapement, which helps the pendulum to keep swinging back and forth. There are two kinds of crutches. Some are closed with a piece of metal across the end connecting the two prongs. Uh, others are open like this one. And uh, again, that can be a clue who made the clock if you don't already know. Many clock makers did sign the dial to the clock, but usually that was only done on um, the eight day clock. Typically, not always, but typically, they did not um, always sign a 30 hour clock, although some people did, some clock makers did. Did you realize that there are trains running inside um, a clock? Elizabeth, I have a message on my screen here it says live transcription closed caption has been enabled. Like yes, we had we had one of our, our our attendees ask me to enable that, so I did. Okay, I can just sex that out there, I guess. Yep. yep. Okay, there we go. Very good. Trains are simply uh, a series of gears that interact in order to produce a desired goal. There are two trains. One is the time train, which actually keeps the hands moving. The other is the strike train that rings the bell each hour or quarter hour, whatever your clock is designed to do. And the red arrow points to the time train in this case. The green arrow points to the calendar wheel. That's what it looks like on the back. Uh, the numbers of the days of the month would be on the side that you can't see, and that would be viewed through the frown face that is just seen there to the left of the calendar wheel. This one, I'm just simply giving a perspective that uh, the large gray brownish mass on the left side uh, partially identified by the red bracket. That's the back of the dial. That's what it looks like on the back side, not all attractive, but on the opposite side would be the face of the clock. And it is attached where I have the yellow stars. There's actually three of them on this clock. The other one is on the other side that cannot be seen. But um, again, different clock makers would attach the dial in different ways. And just to make sure we understand, the red arrow here is pointing to the main 
shaft that the hands would be attached to on the opposite side of the dial. Here I've taken the movement out of the case entirely and set it on my workbench uh, to do a little maintenance and also just to get a better picture of it. And um, you can see the various parts there, the bell, the hammer that strikes the bell, the pendulum bridge. You can see now that the pendulum bridge has a slot in it right here, which is where the pendulum spring slides into to hold it in place. And um, here you can just see a little bit of the time train. Over on this side, you can see the strike train much better from this angle. And here is the crutch, which can be seen much better than when it was inside the case. This is the crutch that holds the pendulum in place here. You can see mine is open-ended. There's no connection here at the tip. And again, it would be attached to the escapement at the top. That pretty much is my clock movement 101 presentation. Now I'm going to look at some of the clock makers because I think some of them are pretty interesting. When I think of clock making in the Cocalico Valley, the Gorgas family is what I would call the royal family of clock making. Uh, they certainly head the list. Jacob Gorgas um, was the son of John and Psyche in Germantown. He married Christina Mack, the granddaughter of Alexander Mack from the uh, Church of the Brethren, then known as the um, German Baptist Brethren. And together they moved to Ephrata in 1765 and became householders at the uh, cloister. The house on the bottom left, the sandstone house, was the first house that they built and lived in. No, it did not have air conditioning units originally. That came much later, of course. That house is still standing. It's on Sunset Avenue in Ephrata, about a block beyond the Cucalico Creek on the opposite side of the creek from the cloister. In 1777, Jacob and Christina built another house, uh, the white one on the right side. That's on the corner of Main and Oak Streets in Ephrata, just a couple of blocks away from the other house. And that's where he really took off with his business and had quite a successful clock making career there. That house today stands on the opposite side of Oak Street from the Historical Society of the Cocalico Valley. And you may recognize it as the 1777 Americana Inn today uh, with the, what is it? The uh, Black Forest Brewery in the back end of it. Jacob made a lot of clocks. It's estimated that he made close to 200 clocks in his career. I don't think there's any that is more breathtaking than this one right here. This one was made about 1770, and it was made for his brother-in-law, William Deshawn. William had married Hannah, uh, Hannah Mack, and they too were householders at Ephrata. This clock is exquisite. I think. It looks to me like it's mahogany wood. I don't know for sure. Mahogany was not the most common wood in Lancaster County because it was so expensive. But this one sure looks like it to me. I'm not a wood expert. Um, you can see the intricate carvings, the, the beautiful work that has gone into making this, the nice um, pen uh, pediment up here with beautiful rosettes right there. The finials, they're a little bit over the top for me, but um, I'm sure at that time they were considered uh, exquisite. Uh, this is an eight-day clock. 
rather than signing his own name on the dial, Jacob Gorgas signed the name William Deschamps. Now, he didn't make the clock, but he got his name put on the clock anyways as a way to honor him. And right here on the top of the um, waist, the initials W. D were engraved in here, uh, again, to honor Deshang. This clock is on display at the Historical Society of the Calico Valley. And I would invite you to stop by there and take a look at it sometime when you get a chance. These are two other clocks made by Jacob Gorgas. Um, the one on the left uh, was made a little bit later, about 1780. It's made out of walnut wood, still an extremely attractive piece of, uh, of furniture and machinery. The one on the right is a flat top case. That one is an, a 30 hour clock. Uh, it's a little bit older, 1775 or thereabouts, but it just shows the diversity of Jacob Gorgas and his um, the clocks that he made. Jacob and Christina had several children, two of which became clockmakers in their own right, Solomon and Joseph, although Joseph did not really get into it like, uh, like the others. We, in fact, we only know of one clock that Joseph uh, is credited for. Um, he did get into some watchmaking Solomon made a few more, nothing like his dad, but uh, he certainly did make some nice clocks. He also was diversified. He went into a lot of other business ventures. He was a retailer, um, a tavern owner, uh, a politician even. Um, both of these boys moved out of the Ephra area sometime after their father had passed away. The clock shown here is a Solomon Gorgas clock, and it's a fine clock. It's a 30-hour uh, movement. However, the case was not well maintained. Uh, as you can see in the notes there, the um, side windows on the hood are cracked. Uh, it's missing feet, which were probably removed either because they were broken or the clock was too tall, one or the other. Um, there's a few other things missing, some of the quarter columns missing on the end or on the corners of the waist. Um, and you can tell by looking at it, the wood uh, was not well maintained, looks even like it had some water damage to it. In contrast, this is a beautiful flat top case. And this is made by Jacob Gorgas, but not the same Jacob Gorgas. This has been a point of confusion for many students of uh, clock making in this area. Jacob Gorgas was the nephew of the first Jacob Gorgas. Uh, this guy's father was a brother to Jacob Gorgas. And um, this is a beautiful flat top case, uh, very well maintained. Uh, it too is in the Historical Society of the Cocalico Valley, right next to the Deshang clock, which is a really nice contrast to the kinds of clocks that were made in Lancaster County. The Deshang, very elaborate. This one, quite simple, both beautiful. Jacob Gorgas made many clocks, especially after he moved to Hinkletown. He only stayed in Ephra for about five years before he moved to Hinkletown, which is only a few miles, maybe three miles east of where the cloister is. We don't know where Jacob's shop was in Ephra. We don't even know for sure where it was in Hinkletown. I think I have an idea, but I can't uh, narrow that down for sure. This clock is a beautiful example of an 1813 uh, eight-day clock by Jacob Gorgas of Hinkletown. I know the owner of this clock. I've seen this clock. It is beautiful. Everything in it is original, and it still runs and keeps perfect time. 
The one thing I would point out, if you look at the close up of the dial, there are four hands attached to the same shaft or arbor, the hour, the minute, the seconds, and the calendar hand, all attached and operating off of the same shaft. Uh, pretty amazing stuff, if you ask me. Now we come to Benjamin Gorgas. And to be honest with you, I could spend an hour easily talking about Benjamin, but I'm not going to do that tonight. Benjamin was a brother to Jacob Gorgas of Hinkletown. He too was raised in the cloister environment uh, as a householder. And after he married Katrina Gear, yes, that is a relative of mine. Um, Katrina Gear would be my third great grand aunt, the sister to my third great grandfather. And um, after they married, they became members, household members of the cloister. And later, he was a trustee in the German Seventh day Baptist Church. Why do I have this clock pictured here? The fact is, we don't know of any clock made by Benjamin Gorgas. Personally, I think this one might be made by him. If it was not made by him, I think he owned it. And I have reasons for that, but I'm not going to go into all of that now. This happens to be the clock that is sitting in my living room and has been in my family for over 200 years. Now we're going to do a quick look at some other clockmakers in the uh, 1700s that were in the Cacalico Valley. John Belsner was only here for four years. Uh, late in life, he came from Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, but he did make some clocks while he was here as well. He was a householder at the cloister, but I've seen four of his clocks and every one has an extremely simple, uh, almost primitive case that uh, the clock is in, um, causing me to wonder if maybe, I cannot say for sure, but maybe the brothers at the cloister made the cases for Belsner, I don't know. This particular clock pictured here is a Belsner clock, but it's in a replacement case, a case that was made in the late 1900s, whereas the clock was made in the 1780s. So um, that makes you wonder what was wrong with the first case that they decided to put it in this one instead. No idea. If only these things could talk. Huber, Cease, and Leinbach are others. They did not make a lot of clocks. Huber and Leinbach worked out of Reamstown. Cease was only in the county for one year before he moved to Harrisburg. And now we come to one of my favorite clockmakers. This is Abel Whitwer. I am so glad to be able to talk about Abel. Uh, he was a householder at the cloister, although he never married, he was not a celibate member, never took on the vows and, and the lifestyle of the celibates. But um, he is the only one we know for sure had his shop on the cloister grounds. He was later a trustee of the German Seventh-day Baptist Church that assumed uh, control of the property after the celibates died. And um, he made clocks that were considered very fine, but he did not make a lot of them. His great, great nephew says that he was also a skilled carpenter and he and his nephew Abraham worked making furniture and coffins. Well, that was typical of furniture makers. And so it makes me wonder if maybe he made the cases for his clocks as well. That would maybe explain why he did not make a whole lot of them. This one's beautiful. It is on display in the visitor center at the uh, Ephrata Cloister. 
I did come across a newspaper clipping from 1970 about an estate sale that featured, quote, a grandfather's clock labeled Abel Whitworth. And it took me a while to find out, but it did bring $1,500 at that auction, which suggests to me that they did not know what they had. I think it should have brought more than that, probably. This is traditionally the clockmaker's cottage at the cloister. If it looks familiar, that's because it probably is. It's now the print shop at the cloister. Spoiler alert. The printing press never operated out of this building, but it's a good place to display it for, um, for exhibition. Uh, but we do know that, or at least legend says that Abel Whitwer made clocks in this building while he was working in that uh, capacity. Now we're going to move on into the 18th century. I'm sorry, the 19th century, the 1800s. And we'll do this very quickly. The Bernison family was two generations that worked out of Adamstown at first and then later Reamstown. Reamstown really became quite a center for clock making. Um, John Kunkel was a clock maker just outside of Ephra in what was called Trout Run. I would assume that that was Trout Run Road, which runs just north of Ephra, a little piece, um, but I don't know for sure where his house would have been. John Zuber is not a very well-known clockmaker, and he was only in Ephra for a very short time before he moved to Lancaster. The Fraser family was a well-known name in clockmaking. Um, they operated out of a town called New Ephrata, which we knew later to be Lincoln, and today is annexed into the borough of Ephrata. This was three generations of clockmakers, and um, Brooks Palmer says in his book that the Frasers made more clocks than anybody else in Lancaster County. Stacy Wood debates that a little bit. However, they did make a lot of clocks and look at the dates. We're looking at the second half of the 1800s. By this point in time, clockmakers rarely made their own parts anymore. They were buying parts that were manufactured in bulk and they simply put them together. So yes, I'm sure they could make a lot more clocks that way. With that, I would like to, oh, by the way, the Fraser House, um, a picture of it can be seen in a book produced by the Historical Society called A Nostalgic Journey Through the Cacalico Valley. It does not exist anymore. It's now the parking lot for Hewlett Associates. We're gonna take a quick look at some of the clocks that are on display at the cloister because they all have some connection to clock making in this uh, area. First of all, we have the clock that is in the manuscript room in the Sarin. Uh, this clock was made by John George Hoff Sr. in Lancaster. So no, he's not a Cocalico Valley clock maker. He was a very prominent clockmaker, however. And this one is dated about 1770, but the case is believed to be made by the brothers in the wood shop at the cloister. And if you look at it, it's an extremely simple case. There are no columns on the hood, no quarter columns on the uh, waist or the base. Uh, the pendulum door is simply a rectangular piece of wood with no shaping of any kind. Um, actually, the case looks an awful lot like the John Belsner cases that I had seen pictures of, which again makes me wonder who made his cases. This is another clock also made by John George Hoff Sr. in Lancaster a few years later. 
This one is located in the bakery in the upper level, the residential level of the bakery. It's a beautiful clock, it really is. It's a flat top um, and it's a, a 30 hour movement, but uh, the case definitely has a little more style to it, a little more flair, you might say. Close up of the dial shows that uh, Hoff painted the dial red. He did that to a number of his clocks. I know of at least three where he painted the dial red and really it shows up very nice against the pewter chapter ring and the pewter spandrels. Those spandrels in the corners of the dial, right here and here, these were sort of the trademark of Hoff Sr. He bought these by the cases and put them on his clocks very frequently. And uh, the one in the Saren also has the exact same spandrel. So we know that uh, Hoff made both of these. And there's a close up of the dial with his name engraved on the chapter ring. And now we come to the Faunestock clock. I love this story. This is probably the best clock story you're going to hear tonight anyways. Casper Faunestock was a householder here. He went back to Germany in 1753 to visit some relatives and to convince a number of people to come to Ephra. When he left here to go to Germany, he was asked by the brothers to bring back a clock and maybe some watches. This is one that he brought back. According to the catalog information that I got from um, Carrie Moan, our curator, the clock was made in Germany by a fellow named Hoker and the hood is original to the movement. Only the hood. The rest of the case is believed to be made by the brothers after he returned from his trip, which is interesting. I can believe that the brothers did not make the hood. This is called an arch top hood, which was less popular, but very nice. And it really is a very attractive hood. Um, there are windows on the side that uh, have that, that are on a door to be able to access the movement. Very nice piece of work. I believe it might be walnut wood. I don't know for sure. Again, I'm not a wood expert. The brothers made the waist and the base and came out with a very attractive product with one problem. They made the waist too narrow for the pendulum to swing back and forth without hitting the sides. Their solution to that was to cut holes into the side of the waist so that the pendulum had a couple of extra inches on each side and they covered those holes with a block of wood. It really came out rather attractive and you would not have any idea that a mistake was made. They called these wooden covers ears. So be careful when you go in the Zoll Watch what you say. There's probably a clock listening to every word that you say. Folks, that brings us to the end of my presentation tonight. If you want to read further, you can check out some of these resources that I have listed here. And I'd be happy to try to entertain some questions if, uh, if you would have any. Thank you for your time. Doug, thank you very much. We do have one question while we're waiting for others to put in some questions. B is wondering how many clocks could a reputable clockmaker make within a year and where did they get all of their parts? Before 1800, they made all the parts of the movement themselves. How many could they produce in the course of a year? That depended an awful lot if they were working by themselves or if they had somebody else helping them, perhaps a journeyman um, or a partner. Uh, I really 
Don't know the answer to that. I would say probably about three clocks a year. That's my guess. Um, but it would depend on the person and the amount of help that they had. And remember, they did not make the case, at least 97% of the time, the clockmaker did not make the case that was subcontracted out to a joiner um, who never got credit for the work. How much was the average clock when it was new? Eric would like to know that. Good question. The 30 hour clock uh, from advertisements that we have found in um, various newspapers, a 30 hour clock typically brought between 25 and $35, which was a fair sum of money, usually the most expensive item in a house. Uh, an eight day clock would bring between 30 and $50 depending on the woodwork and what all went into it, whether it had a second hand or not, um, the moon dial, all of those extra features would bring the price up. Okay, so um, Ken DeLuca is with us tonight. He's the educator at Watch and Clock in Columbia, and he Great. has something um, about the, the last question. Ken, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and you can, um, uh, rather than have people want to read it? Um, I'll, I'll be glad to. Is uh, audio okay? Yes, that's fine. Uh, first of all, Doug, thank you for letting me uh, jump in. You did, you did a great job with uh, uh, introduction to uh, Tall Clocks uh, of Lancaster County. Great, great job. Um, I was just going to say uh, w what made um, uh, how many clocks, what you were limited to was how many apprentices uh, people would have working for them. Uh, some clockmakers would do the right thing with apprentices and have only one to teach that person to trade very diligently. Others would have as many as they could get to crank them out, you know, and get them through. Um, and then subsequently, as, as Douglas mentioned, um, more support Supplies, more stuff came from England uh, later on uh, when in fact there were clock kits where they would have to uh, finish um, filing out teeth or spoking out the wheels, that type of stuff. Uh, but as we got further from the coast, um, it was harder and harder to get those supplies. But um, I just wanted to throw that in. And D Douglas, thank you for a fine job. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, so I have a question for you while we wait to see if anybody else has a question. So the clock that you said has all its original parts. Mm -hmm. Does it have its original lead weights? Yes, original lead weights and even wooden pulleys. Uh, because in my neck of the woods, because of our proximity to the Battle of Brandywine, if you look at the register of damages for Chester County, often clocks would were taken. They weren't necessarily taken to be clocks. They they were taken for the lead, for the lead weights. Yeah. And very seldom in not often in Chester County, I don't believe you find one with original lead weights. Hmm, uh, interesting. That's for historical society has one. The clock itself was made in England. Um, and it always was local, and somehow they managed to hang on to their lead weights. I should also probably say that among the English culture, um, tall case clock was considered a little bit more of a luxury item or an elite possession. The Germans were much more practical. They loved their clocks, but then they had a longer history of clock making, I suppose. But that's my understanding is that the Germans had clocks in abundance, whereas the English tended to um, to get a clock more as a, a keepsake and pass it on in the family. Well, the Germans passed them on, too, for that matter. Um, but uh, there was a little bit of a difference in the way they looked at clocks. Interesting. Growing up, we had my mom always had a clock over the fireplace mantle, and it was always a Roman numeral clock. And we'd have friends come over, and they'd want to know what time it is. And we say the clock's right up there, and they'd go, 
I, I can't read that. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, we always had to explain the numbers are in the same place. <laughs> they just look a little different. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think- I'll just simply close by saying, I think we can learn a lot from these clocks. Um, teamwork, for example, all the parts have to work together. Um, the clock maker has to realize he can't do it all by himself. He needs somebody else. He needs to buy certain things like the dial and uh, also um, you know, farm out the case to somebody who was uh, worthwhile doing that. The case maker, the joiner, had to be willing to do it anonymously. And um, I think there's a lot to learn in all of that. Great. Well, this is excellent. We have a lot of wonderful compliments here. I will share the chat with you later, Doug. Okay. And thank you so much for tonight. That was wonderful. Well, thank you. It's and, been a lot uh, of fun. Michael, do uh, you want to uh, unmute yourself, Michael, and talk, tell about next week or next month? You have a little bit of an idea where, where we're going with next month. Do you want to give a little? Sure. Thank, thank you. Um, so last month, we asked folks for ideas for more presentations for this program. And that's part of what spurred on Doug's presentation, because we had a lot of people say they want to know more about trades. So clock making is the first trade we've tackled. Another suggestion from last month was the Ephrata Academy, sort of the inspiration for the name of this series. The Ephrata Academy is the big white building right at the entrance to our historic property. And it was built by the community in 1837 uh, as a schoolhouse for their children, uh, later became a public school. But I don't want to give away too much of the story because that's going to be our topic for next month, the education process at Ephrata. And the academy is almost 100 years after school starts at Ephrata Cloister. And so we're going to talk a little bit about education in the early days and also the schoolhouse itself. So stay tuned next month. It should be June 9. I think that's the second uh, Thursday night of, of the month of June. And uh, so we'll sneak in a little bit of school talk just before graduation hits us and, uh, and look for you all next month. Doug, we have a couple of uh, uh, questions that just came in too. Uh, Daniel, was, or David, excuse me, David Rhodes says he's trying to learn who made his clockworks. It's brass with a wood case. It's stamped KD. The case is about 1805 from Lebanon County. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with the Lebanon County clockmakers. I'm familiar with uh, Jacob Graff, but that's about the only one I know of. Um, Perhaps the uh, the gentleman from the Watching Clock uh, Museum might be able to help out a little bit better there. I would, if he's still on the line, he could address that. If not, I would suggest that you contact the National Clock and Watch Museum in Columbia. That's where I got a lot of information on my clock. And, and Ken uh, from Watching Clock says, if you join Watching Clock, you have access to the Library and Research Center to find mm -hmm. out some of these things. Yeah, that's a so, fabulous place, by the way. I yes, I am very indebted to them. Um, we have one. What is the timetable of these clocks moving to Western Pennsylvania? Hmm. Wow, um, that's an excellent question. Again, I never really studied outside of Lancaster County, so I really am not qualified to say that. Um, again, I would say check out the uh, clock museum there in Columbia and, uh, and find out from there because they would have far more resources than I have. I'm not an expert in this thing. I'm just a hobbyist who likes to check out the local stuff. And that's as far as I go, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. Were there any female clockmakers that you found? You know, that 
question came across my mind too. I did not find any except, now I shouldn't say that, not in the Cacalico Valley that I know of, but in Lancaster. Um, I'm trying to think which one it was. One of the clockmakers passed on and his wife continued the business in partnership with somebody else. And I'm drawing a blank on the name, who that was. And again, maybe uh, the gentleman from the clock museum could help out on that one. That's the only female that I knew of, and she kind of took over the business after her. Well, I think she helped her husband an awful lot, but after he died, she kind of took over. Um, and, and that wasn't too, too unusual at that time period. No, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, yeah, Ken says you're correct, but I can't remember her name either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I don't feel so bad. <laughs> so now that's going to bug both of you all night long. Yeah, I'll have to look that one up. And, and he Stacey. says there was also a daughter who took over a business. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I know it's in Stacy Wood's book, but I, I don't recall the name offhand. <laughs> all right, everyone. I'm just going to do a little plug. We have a lot going on at the Cloister this weekend. We have Community Day school program tomorrow from 9.30 to 1. Uh, some of you listening, I know, will be helping us out as volunteers. Um, we're, it, we encourage adults to come to this as well. While it's designed for the kids, um, adults who do happen to wander in that day are thrilled because we actually have a lot of people doing things, a lot of volunteers and staff demonstrating and talking about different um, things that were part of the everyday in 18th century uh, colonial Pennsylvania. So if you're looking for something to do a little bit tomorrow morning, come on out and see us. Then on Saturday at one o'clock, we have the Pennsylvania Historical Marker dedication. This is the marker that's recognizing the three Ephratus sisters as the first documented women composers in the um, British North American colonies. So we have that at one and that's followed at 2.30 with the chorus's spring concert. The chorus uh, sang at the uh, Candlelight Open House and Christmas at the Cloister, but this is their first uh, concert of the, pretty much, I think pretty much the first concert of the season uh, for 2022. So if you're Looking for some things to do on Saturday. We, we've got plenty to keep you busy or come on out and see us tomorrow at Community Days. We love to talk with everybody. Again, thank you all for joining Elizabeth, us. Elizabeth, excuse me, not to interrupt, but there's also over in the chat, uh, Dorothy King had a question. Oh, which, had, where was that? I did ask about the women. That was Dorothy's. Were there any female clockmakers? That was Dorothy's question. I don't think there was another one. Was there another one? Yes, she had an earlier question. Dorothy uh, had an color. earlier one. Sorry, Dorothy. Where is it here? Let me see. Um, oh, were there any people of color who made clocks in the area? That's an excellent question. To my knowledge, no. Um, yeah, from... From all my research, I did not find any. That doesn't mean there weren't any, especially in the later years of the 19th century, perhaps, but I'm not aware of them. That's a good question. I have to check into that one. Ken says Benjamin Banneker from Philly, he thinks, maybe. Okay. Thanks, Ken. You've been a big yes. help. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you all for joining us. Let me hit the stop button here.